Thanks, Mark. Hi, everybody, and welcome to our panel. Um, uh, my name is Tom Cavanaugh. I am Vice Provost for Digital Learning at the University of Central Florida in Orlando. And I am very happy to be joined today by some great colleagues. Um, I will introduce them uh, by, by name and title, rank and serial number. Uh, first is uh, Dr. Shauna Dark, who is the Chief Academic Technology Officer and Executive Director for Research, Teaching and Learning for the University of California at Berkeley. And Dr. Yakut Ghazi is the Associate Dean for Learning Systems at Georgia Tech Professional Education. And we may still yet be joined by uh, Nick White, who is the Chief Learning Officer for Alternative Learning at Strategic Education, Inc. Um, we are, are hoping Nick will be able to join us, but if not, we will proceed ahead with the, with the three of us. So this particular session was uh, inspired by a lot of the um, rhetoric that I and others have been seeing that is conflating the pivot to emergency remote instruction with the kind of intentionally designed asynchronous online learning that we've been doing for 25 years or so and equating them as the same thing with articles such as well now research says it's clear students don't like online learning or thanks to the pandemic we now have all this great research on whether or not online learning works and what we did during the pandemic in many cases was not online learning it was emergency synchronous remote instruction. And uh, I, I've been worrying about the, the narrative spinning out of our control and ending up in policymakers' hands and boards' hands and presidents' hands and decisions being made based on this, this conflation. So I wanted to talk about that and, and what we can maybe do to kind of rest the narrative back um, it, into something that's more evidence-based and based upon this you know, history that we have. So with that, let me let me just first kind of open up with a general question, which is, have either of you experienced or seen this phenomenon, this what I call the, the great conflation? It's my new hashtag I'm trying to start on, on Twitter, the great conflation. Um, and if you did, what did you do about it in the moment? Did, did you call them out or correct it? Um, uh, and I'll uh, maybe I'll start with you, Shauna. Yeah, thank you. You know, I um, it's funny because I um, gave a little workshop in a freshman seminar at Berkeley last week, and this topic came up. Um, students were asked a discussion question about how their experience has been, and the discussion really was all about online education and how much they, how unhappy they were, how things have been going, and, da, da, da. and so I was really excited about it. I'm always an optimist, and um, did what I have been doing throughout the pandemic, which is really taking a moment to clarify terminology and to clarify what it takes to create an online course and why what we've been doing is not considered to be traditional online education. And I think, um, you know, from our, my perspective, that's the very best thing that I can do is to take those moments and use them as a really valuable point in time where you can clarify terminology, where you can make it really clear about what it takes to deliver online education um, and do that frequently and elevate that up to leadership, which is one of the things we've been really fortunate at Berkeley. Um, in my role, I've been able to have very close contact with the provost, the vice provost for undergraduate education and kind of have these conversations so that their communications out to campus are also making that distinction. Um, so I think that's one thing that we can do that's really critical. And I will hand over to Yakut because she probably has more to add. Oh, yes. Um, and thank you, Tom. And thank you for inviting me to be a part of this conversation. Uh, and Shauna, I mean, just, just like you, I don't know if there is much to add, but um, I, I, I know I participated in conversations several times over the course of the past 18 months. And I wrote about how this is not online. And, and I think, you know, at least at the administrative level at my institution, folks understand. But then when we go down to, you know, some faculty understand as well, especially those who do online really well with a lot of effort, they understand what it takes to make it work. 
But then, you know, there are there is a group of faculty who now say, I can do online by myself. Why do I need groups like my group, right? And then I think even students have have a misunderstanding, just like you know, in your case, Shauna, they think, oh, we want online from now on, thinking that what they were exposed to, which is you know, in a lot of ways, simultaneous um, broadcast of of uh, instruction. So I think the first. Uh, well, how we finished the spring semester was even different than how we did instruction in the last academic year, right? It was emergen emergency response first, a lot of online virtual. And then I think, you know, we shifted to um, broadcasts in a lot of ways, live broadcasts. I mean, we have programs like that. We have 10 distance learning programs that we've been doing for over 40 years. We basically piggyback on lecture capture from the, uh, from the instructor, uh, from the classroom. I have 15 people supporting that model. It is an expensive model. It, it heavily um, supports faculty so that they can focus on the, their, their teaching and everything else we take care of. So obviously, you know, we didn't do that at a scale this, this past year. So um, I come from a, from a belief that online is the most student-centric approach to education. Because how do we start thinking about online? Where do students need to go? How do we know they get there? How do we assess, right? How they get there? What do we provide to them so that they achieve those learning objectives? And then somewhere down the line, you're like, okay, what do we teach them? Which is you know, completely different than what we do in the lecture, especially lecture-based classrooms. So it is, it is very heartbreaking to look at what we're doing today and in the past 18 months and call it online. And we know that, you know, in, in typical, I mean, 80 to 90% of the cases, we didn't bring that student-centric perspective that online so nicely done and done well uh, to, the, um, to the forefront of our activity. You each mentioned something really interesting separately that, that I wanted to kind of dig into a little bit more. So Shauna, you, you talked about language and, and kind of the, the terminology that we use. And I, I actually think it's something that I've tried to be disciplined about here to use precise language so when, when we're talking about emergency remote synchronous instruction, I don't call it online learning, um, even though I've noticed that it, it gets called that a lot, like in Inside Higher Ed and some other places where they're talking about studies that are done. How, how important is that? And uh, are there terms that, that we think we've sort of all coalesced around? I don't remember us all having a big meeting and deciding here the terms we're going to use, but it seems like remote instruction seems to be kind of what we've we've all kind of landed on but i wonder if either of you have have any thoughts on on the importance of precise language and, and what terms we should use yeah i'll um i'll start with that i do think it's i, I do think we were coalescing around like remote emergency instruction and online with a distinction there i mean it seems like there's some consistency um in colleagues across the country when when we're talking about the the pandemic and i want to add that i think and, and I'm not sure what to do about this. So I think it would be great for you know, a team of people to get together in, in higher ed and our similar roles to talk about how do we define all these new modalities of instruction that are, are coming out. So like this, we can use terminology like hybrid synchronous learning, but, but every campus seems like it's different. And it's certainly at our campus because it's Berkeley and Berkeley does things differently. Every single department has a different type of terminology they're using right now. And I think it's um, prohibited. I think it's a problem. I think that we really need to like, as um, you know, professionals in higher education, we really need to be able to identify specific language about what we are talking about and really think about it so that we can come up with new language to describe the new modalities that are emerging, right? In a way that, is perhaps um, palatable to people who don't know a lot about the work that we do, right? In, in administration and that kind of thing. Um, and I just think it's really important for planning and that sort of thing. So um, I agree wholeheartedly, yes. That's a great I point. think it's really critical. I, I think there was an article just last week in the Chronicle that conflated hybrid and high flex. Yes. So it's like, okay, okay so now, now we're calling 
high high flex hybrid. Flex. Like, okay, is that a new thing or is it just a mistake? I, but that's not what I've ever, how I've ever referred to those. No, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And I, I was going to bring up hybrid, uh, Tom, because I think hybrid took a big hit during the pandemic, just like online did, because what we started calling hybrid, hybrid at least at my institution, is simulcast, right? High flex, basically. So, yeah. And then now it's also starting to sound like inverted learning. Right. So the pedagogy gets mixed up with the modality and it's all, it's all exactly. I mean, there are times I'm like, okay, so how do I explain this? And if I'm having <laughs> explaining this, how can I expect others to understand? So I think, you know, at one point we need to also, you know, no matter how much we explain, people are not going to hear the nuances. Right. So yes. what do we do as next step to to simplify this? So pre-pandemic, I was I was feeling irritated about the. I mean, I, I may I may make um, enemies by saying this. The the learning learner learning engineering, this you know evolve the evolution of learning engineering, and we have learning designers and instructional technologists, and now we're adding more and more, and then we're saying, hey, there are nuances, and it's already a new profession, right? How do we expect others to understand? Being a new profession, you're just you know making it even more balkanized. So now I think you know the whole field is in that same confusion and us trying to explain. But maybe you know the right thing to do is to separate the, the modality from this conversation and focusing on engagement, mm -hmm. right? Like mm -hmm. redefining the field, not based on delivery modality, but types and varieties of student engagement. And, and maybe that's going to bring us to a new platform of conversation that is not going to be, um, you know, tainted by this past experience. And it's, it's, not, it's not easy. I'm saying this as if it's easy, but <laughs> I'm just trying to figure out because people are not going to understand or care or have the time to, to you know, pay attention to these nuances or even care about those nuances. The other thing that, um, that you brought up Yakut in a, in a previous answer, touched on sort of faculty and, and, and faculty development, which has always been so essential in, in quality for intentionally designed asynchronous online learning. It's a big part of what we think our secret sauce is here at UCF. We have required rigorous like 10 week faculty development program, but now everybody's been doing this for the last 18 months on Zoom in an emergency with no training and they are like, it's been fine, you know, hasn't been so horrible. Why do I have to go through your thing, Tom, and, and, and go through all this training? I am I know how to teach. I've been teaching for 20 years. Now I'm doing it on Zoom. But it's not the same, right? It it's not, doesn't mean that it's the best that we can do or that it's rigorous. Ha, have you encountered this with faculty? And have how have you responded to this question of, yeah, but now it's time to kind of, you know, systematize this back into our quality processes in a way that we, we just didn't have the, the luxury of time to do during the pandemic. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think, you know, here in the online programs that we develop, we're, we're a centralized unit. So pre-pandemic, everything went through our unit. So we had this intensive design and development period with faculty during which we prepared them. And then I think, you know, in addition to faculty, faculty preparation, support is the other piece that is so essential to putting something of quality in front of people. Uh, and I, yes, we are having those conversations at our institutions, and I don't know if there's a, there's a good answer, but I think faculty do understand that there's that support piece, even if, if, even if they say, hey, I'm, I, I know how to do this now, I've been teaching and now I know the technology, but I think they still believe in the importance of support while they're doing it. Um, so the, the, the other thing is um, they, they also want to cater to the students, right? Students want those um, recorded materials as study materials and uh, faculty want to be able to do that. But you know, having something in front of students as study materials is not teaching online. Right. The key is if a student starts struggling, do you have the, the sensors in place to know that that student is struggling? Because you know, seasoned faculty would say, I can look at a student in the classroom and I will tell you if they have question marks in their heads, right? So what is the analog of that in the online environment? What sensors do you have? And then how, how soon do you detect it? How soon do you remedy it? And that makes the difference. And I don't think you get to a point of being able to do that just by going through this pandemic. 
and knowing how to create materials and then just doing a Zoom class, right? There is still that component of um, being able to help students and then turning that into retention and success still in the, uh, in the mix there. Yeah, we've been at Berkeley thinking about this a lot um, because we haven't had a big online presence, right? And um, trying to identify, so number one, I'm really excited that faculty are having all these experiences and want to use technology at a place like Berkeley. For us, it's like, oh my goodness, finally, we're like at a place where people are seeing the value of technology and and are seeing how it, they can engage students and are reflecting on what the student expectations are. So that's great. But then the challenge is, is very much around for us academic freedom and like how, how do we control the quality of courses that are now being taught online um, when there's no structure at Berkeley where they have to go through us. Like faculty can just say, I'm gonna create my own online course, get it approved through the academic senate and deliver that course. And of course, ideally they're getting evaluations and they're getting, you know, assessments from, you know, peers and that kind of thing. But it's very different from having an instructional designer from our unit helping to design the course who has trained and how to, you know, put together a course that really is meeting the outcomes of the course, right? The learning outcomes of the course. And um, so that's something I don't have an answer to yet. I mean, you know, it's, um, I don't know how to wrap my head, my head around that quite yet. Um, and we're, we're just sorting through it. It's, um, it's a very interesting time. Um, I can just add one more thing yeah, to this, this particular segment. Um, uh, Jose Bowen, who uh, wrote the book on Teaching Naked, you remember. Mm -hmm. So if, uh, several weeks ago, there was a Chronicle article where he said, those who stayed the same during a transition end up losing. So yeah. um, then, you know, we base a lot of, I mean, we're professionals in this space, right? And in, in 2012, the year of the MOOC, folks in Berkeley, folks at Stanford and MIT mm -hmm. and Harvard discovered online and they they said, oh, now we prove we can do online. And all of us were like, hey, 20 years here, you know? Right. So, um, but then that forced us to rethink some of the things that we, mm -hmm. we think we know. And I think one thing that was introduced in 2012 is learning at scale, right? Making mm -hmm. online, not a 20 student endeavor, but <clears throat> making it of quality at scale. So. So what does this experience tell us in terms of the questions that were asked in the past, pre-pandemic, pre and the answers that we provided those questions, are they still valid, right? I feel like, you know, some of those seminal work we will have to reevaluate uh, through a lens of COVID. Uh, one thing, mm -hmm. for example, um, in terms of online readiness, there's one aspect of this is technology readiness, right? Both yep. faculty and students. I mean, after going through this, does that even matter anymore, right? Is anybody not ready technologic? No, access is another thing, right? Folks may not have access to the technology, but everybody uh -huh. was exposed to Zoom. So, you know, how do we redefine um, readiness for online learning? And how does it differ from remote learning and what we did in the past? So what, what are some valuable research questions to re-ask and re-answer as, as a result of this experience? Sorry, Tom, I hope I, hope I didn't. I love that. No, I, you were no, I, that. I think you're absolutely right. Um, yeah. But, but it is probably also worth noting that, I mean, the three of us work at research universities that are have a different kind of profile than, say, a community college or a mm -hmm. tribal college or something like that. And, you know, everybody is serving a, a slightly different population with different kinds of contextual contextual needs, which, which um, you know, informs the decisions that they have to make. But I, but I think they're probably... Mm -hmm. Maybe even dealing with these questions more than we are, because if they didn't have an online strategy, like yeah. how do you define this? How do you prepare faculty for, you know, quality online learning? What do you call it? You know, all of the things that, that we've been talking about. Um, at this point, I also want to um, mention uh, to the to the folks who might be watching um, that if you have a question, put it in the chat. But I'm going to have to ask Mark to 
to raise a, a hand if he sees it, because I don't think we can see the chat of the participants. I think we just see each other. So mm -hmm. if there are questions in the chat, we want to make sure we get to them. Um, and I'll, I'll uh, give you sort of a, you know, here's a little a warning go ahead and put them in now um and then we'll uh we'll try to reserve some time towards the end to to address those uh, so think about any questions that you might have um and then just go ahead and pop them in the, in the chat um all right so an another question i have and since i brought up the concept of research universities it is research so there are all these like articles coming out now about all right i compared uh this to this based on the pandemic and that therefore online learning is x um, and most of the time it's bad but it's not online learning as we've i think established um and it seems like it's a little specious research it's sort of like it, it reminds me back where people were like i compared my face-to-face -face section with my online section now i'm drawing these broad conclusions about online learning in general it's kind of a b studies that were always being published that I don't know if it's real research, right, at the kind of level that's systemic, but we're seeing it. And you know, how important is really good peer review, well-designed research in countering this this conf the great conflation? Yeah, I just I'm so glad you brought this up because it's something that um, because I have so many questions, I think that in our positions, we're almost obligated to help coordinate with folks who do research around education and online education and instructional technology um, and really partner with them to use our own campuses as, as our learning space, you know, and really do, it's where I am really sinking my teeth in. This has really become a part of the vision of the work that we're doing is partnering with our college of our school of education um, and the faculty there to really get a better understanding of both what happened during the pandemic as well as afterwards. And, you know, we've, um, I have a huge advantage because we have our Center for Teaching and Learning, which is housed in my unit. And that unit is really focused on pedagogy and research. So it's awesome because I already have a team kind of built in that can help pick up some of this work and a great partnership with the School of Education. We also have um, uh, Enterprise Data Lake where all of our instructional, like, you know, all of our learning analytics, all of our data is going into that data lake. So we are actually really well poised to start doing research. And I think we need to do it. I think we need to partner and, and so that we can help industry sort of, uh, we can help drive industry with the right information um, and really focus on um, true publications and journals and that sort of thing. But that's more of my academic background, probably speaking, so. You do have research in your title. Yeah, exactly. So, um, and I, I reviewed several numerous articles, you know, during, especially in the last six months, because I think, you know, folks wrote their experiences, now they're coming, coming up for peer review. And to your point, both uh, Ton and Shana, Tom and Shana, we, these are the kinds of research studies that I've done as an undergraduate student in like 1993. So uh, very poor research, right? Problematic research, but then that's what's coming out right now. So one, it doesn't really add, I mean, even when it's um, truly experimental, it doesn't really add to the knowledge. Like, you know, what is, what is the impact of this particular research? So I think there's a lot of, uh, responsibility on peer reviewers and especially journals, especially the ones that are, you know, huge journals in our field. Um, and and I'm, I'm thinking maybe there's another aspect as uh, professional organizations. Is there something that we can do, some sort of declaration, some sort of statement that outlines here is here, here are the important things. This is what is impact. This is what the field needs right now not looking at the past experience of you know 12 to 18 months and making um, modality comparisons, but maybe what's needed is um, flexibility, adaptability, both students and faculty perspective, right? Resilience, well-being, and those kinds of things. Maybe that's what's important that coming out of this experience rather than the modality comparisons. It's interesting the things yeah. you were mentioning, they all transcend modality. You know, they apply regardless of a face-to-face -face or an online course. Yeah. Yeah, and I was just going to add to that also, it takes a long time to do research. 
I mean, it, it does. It t- it's not. And so the work that's being done right now is all this kind of quick, whatever, you know, it's, I'm not, it's, it takes a long time to design a research study, you know, a research design that is um, really informative and is not biased and whatever, you know, and um, that it takes time to collect the data and, you know, um, so that's something that I think we can also help to explain to people is that, you know, a lot of these so-called research papers that are coming out are being done in such a tor- short time frame and focused on s- such a short you know, period of time um, that they're they're not the research that we need to do is going to take a couple of years for us to catch up, quite frankly, which is a challenge, right? Because people want data, they want to know what's happening, they want to make changes right now. But I think we have to really give grace to the way in which we approach doing our research and make sure we do it right. Or there are also, I think, some. Not that I'm accusing anybody of anything, but I, I do think some people have a anti online bias. And they're fitting some data to their narrative already. Um, and, and it's easy to do. You just look hard enough. You can find anything to kind of fit your particular perspective, especially in the last 18 months. Uh, I think you can find examples of anything that has happened, especially in the K-12 space, which I, I do think legitimately has had some problems. And um, I think some students have objectively had a bad experience in the K-12 space. And we're getting sort of swept up in that, I think, as part of the narrative. Um, so as this topic comes up on campus, if you hear from a faculty member or, as I have, from a board member, oh, yeah, online learning isn't, it's, now we know they don't, they don't like it or something. You know, how, do you, how do you respond to that? Are there things that you can do locally? Um, a suggestion that was made to me previously, just to kind of get the, the conversation started, was, well, we can start to elevate the, the good examples, because we've got those two, is a counter to these cherry picked bad examples. We got plenty of good ones too. So let's, let's not just be, um, you know, uh, biased one way, but let's try and be a little more, a little more equitable in, in the examples that we share of, of online learning. But are there other things that we can do? Are there particular constituents to bring into the conversation? So Pre-COVID, if something like this happened, right, a faculty member is really critical of online, I think we would approach that conversation a little differently than now. Now there are two battles. One is protecting online, making sure that people do not badmouth it based on this experience, right? And then making sure that people don't think we've done it, we want to do it again. So um, I think, you know, what is, the, what is the problem we're trying to solve with this particular faculty member? In general, I think it's always um, it's always useful to bring a peer faculty member with a positive experience to the conversation, uh, and that's that's that that works well. But again, I think there are now two purposes: is the purpose to make sure that online is understood better, and then um, good examples of online, or is the purpose trying to uh, ha- help this faculty member understand that online takes a lot of time and effort and design thinking, and then bringing um, examples and support uh, for that from that perspective. Yeah, and I would add, I think um, students are really powerful constituent um, to, you know, our, you know, they are the voice of our campuses, right? And if, if we can get them to really understand the distinction, to understand um, how to articulate some of the challenges that we have now with differing terminology and research that's not well informed, that will help us. But also they have an expectation of what they want from us now, right? And um, that expectation has risen. That's why we have all these weird hybrid synchronous whatever, right? Like, because students are, you know, they have challenges that are really different than ever before in higher education and they need uh, more flexible ways of uh, learning, right? And instruction to be delivered to them. And if there's a way that we can empower them to demand really high quality online education, I think that that is something that would be extraordinarily helpful um, for the, and for them to be giving voice to that distinction of the remote emergency learning, right? If they, and 
you know, they're delighted. I mean, this is what I love being in this freshman seminar last week because the students are delighted that faculty are finally posting like assignments, right? And like some faculty weren't even using the learning management system. So they're so happy to be in this space. And, you know, there was a couple of students who were sick and they, you know, um, they wanted to just remote into class rather than be in person. And, you know, like they, and they talked about how great is that? Like, I don't feel sick enough that, you know, I can't sit here and listen and I'm, now I'm not missing class. It's really fun, you know? So like, I mean, right. So students are now developing this expectation and making sure that we help them hold the campus accountable to high quality online education, I just think is going to be critical and extraordinarily helpful for us. Yeah. If I can add two things, one is I think student leaders have been so instrumental and um, they're, they're such a great leverage for both sides of the equation, right? So I think um, never before did I, have I seen this kind of engagement from student leaders and impact. Um, and then the other thing is one of the positive outcomes of um, COVID has been I mean, every year there's, you know, for anything ranging from a handful to maybe 20 cases where we have a student who needs access to courses, right? They either cannot be on campus for some reason, they're sick, you know, maternity leave, whatever. And we would scramble to find a classroom where we can carry that class there. Uh, students with disabilities, you know, similar way. It would be a scramble between our unit, IT, disability services to find a way to be mainly broadcast or recorded lecture for that student. The good thing is now we know how to do it. It's not a scramble. Many of our, uh, uh, of our spaces have the capability and faculty know how to do it. Um, the, on the flip side though, um, my unit, I have, as I mentioned, the distance learning pro program and then we have our at scale programs that are, we design for online from the get go, right? And then pre-pandemic, pre I was seeing this shift towards more intentional design. And I was thinking about maybe, you know, the distance learning programs are, you know, over time, we're going to start sunsetting them. We want to invest in technology this much. Now it's just, you know, turned around. Everybody's asking for more of this investment in the lecture capture spaces, which, um, you know, it worries me because the, the beauty about studio production is we take faculty through that instructional design process because it's a barrier. You cannot walk into the classroom without us mapping out your course, storyboarding and all that. Now, you know, we're, we're moving in the other direction and I didn't think we were going to move. Uh, so it's almost like a great, great retraction, um, Tom, <laughs> to, you know, manipulate your great um, conflation hashtag a little bit. It's a great retraction from moving towards design for online, uh, towards uh, more lecture capture. Yeah, it's, I mean, that's the kind of thing that keeps me up at night, too, that the, the idea that it, when we first started online learning, here's your LMS shell, go teach, right? It was so it was too easy. Now it's here's Zoom, go teach. And now Zoom is provisioned for everybody in the entire universe. You don't even have to ask for it. You just have it. And you can just go teach. It, it is so easy to outrun those quality supply lines and just do bad things or things of low quality because you don't know any better. Um, without kind of holding people back a little bit and saying, we need to put some quality infrastructure around this. And that's training and support and resources and media and everything else that, um, that slows you down when you could just turn on Zoom and start talking. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean, it, mean it's good. I totally take your point, Yakut. So we've talked about what you can do sort of locally. I mean, what can we do as a community? We're having this conversation now as part of learning impact. And um, this is sort of involving the broader community. Um, it, should we all get together with a big meeting and decide what we're going to call it and how, how we're going to, uh, you know, uh, train faculty or whatever going forward? I mean, should there be some level of, of industry wide coordination? You're nodding your head, Shauna. I'll let you go first. Yeah, I think there should, although I don't know that we'd all come to agreement on terminology and that sort of thing, because it depends on the campus and what infrastructure is available and what you know, whatever. But I do think that faculty development piece is a challenge. And I think, you know, it's gonna take a lot of people to figure some of these things out. And so I do, there is a great opportunity for all of us professionally to get together and, um, 
try to focus on you know, the faculty development piece and the quality piece of instruction now that tools are in content are ubiquitous, like how do we manage that, you know, and how do we help ensure that we're that we're putting those guardrails on that you're talking about. Um, and discussion about what are the different modalities? I mean, they're emerging right now. And I just sometimes you, I lay in bed and think about, oh my God, like what, I, I don't even know how to wrap my head around where to begin with some of these emerging modalities, right? And what they mean for student learning. And um, I can't do this alone. I don't think any of us can. And so I do think that there is a need for some type of focused whether it's research or discussion, or maybe, you know, we should lobby for professional conferences like Educause IMS to have these type of sessions where people are engaging in discussion at a minimum and really making it um, an important focus of the work that we're doing at these professional meetings. Um, I just think it's important. I do. I know I can't, I'm not going to figure this out on my own and it's hard right now. We're still really busy. We're all really swamped. I don't know about both of you, but uh, um, my staff are working so hard right now. Still, we are exhausted. I'm working hard, you know, and um, it certainly would be great if there was a space outside of my regular job for having discussions about this and doing some planning and thought around how do we communicate, how do we ensure quality, all those kinds of things. So I do think it's really critical and important. I don't know what that looks like though, right? I'm, I'm just not sure where we would begin. So probably need to get a team together to start talking about that even. Yeah, and maybe identifying, you know, there are policy aspects, right? There's this great con conflation, policy, technology, um, modality, um, engagement, you know, what are, what are these, you know, aspects or, or domains or buckets underneath this, this great completion? What is the accreditor's role? I think they will care a lot about the modality and uh, engagement piece, right? Um, and then um, for, uh, organizations like Quality Matters, where, I mean, the rubric is the rubric, right? You can take that rubric and then use it uh, flexibly looking at a variety of things from online to hybrid. And, you know, what, what is the role of uh, rubrics like OLC's rubric and quality matters rubric in moving us forward and recovering from, from what we're going through? Um, and I mean, IMS Global is all about scale, right? And standards. And I mean, I think it is important for us to get to a common understanding and establish, reestablish some standards so that we can talk to each other and we can do interoperability in this space. Um, so, I mean, Tom, sign me up if, <laughs> if we're having that kind of conversation, um, but I think it's going to have to be a broad multi-year and, and uh, to, just like Shauna said, I mean, my staff and I, we're understaffed, overworked, and then, you know, our productivity is declining. I need more breaks compared to last year, so, um, but this is important. Maybe we should all go on vacation together. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I mean, the, the, the meeting can take place in Hawaii, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Reality cruise or something that we all that we all get on. Um, but you, you've mentioned to me even offline um, the idea of, of publishing, like a, yes. a collection that explores this as a theme, which might not be a bad place to start. And then that can foster some conversations. So who knows? Maybe yeah, more. I, I wasn't sure if I wanted to bring up without. <laughs> Sorry, if I. So, if yeah, I, I mean, I think I love that amazing. idea. Yeah. So maybe, you know, if there are folks interested in the session, they can contact us and we can start with that and that can turn into some convening and another report and so on and so forth. Um, Tom, uh, there's one other aspect of great conflation that's not related to modality that I want to bring up and that's the conflation of academic integrity, digital proctoring. And I don't know if you have time to, you know, delve into, well, we have five minutes, so it's probably Q and A time, but you know, there's that too. Folks think that um, huge. Thank you. Yes. Equals academic integrity, and now folks' negative so reaction about academic uh, digital proctoring um, yeah. just looks so bad for the online programs, where folks come to the programs knowing that this is the kind of thing that they're going to be exposed. So I think there's a lot mm -hmm. of there as well. You're right. That's a huge issue, and it, there's there's so many facets to it because we've actually got some faculty, some of the faculty who were part of the big pivot, right, who were mostly face-to-face -face faculty, who insisted on it, 
right? Who couldn't envision their assessments in any other way. Yeah, and so they're big fans. Yet we've got a lot of students that are kind of like, hey, I hate this. <laughs> um, and then there are some faculty that sort of don't like it either. And they're, they probably have much better assessments that they've developed a little more authentic kinds of assessments. So you're right, it's a, it's a non-trivial issue in the space. Just, just get on Twitter and start searching for some of these proctoring tags and you're, oh boy, you'll see it all <laughs> and a lot of the, the opinions thereof. Mm -hmm. Um, but you're right, we have five minutes. So Mark, I'm not sure if we got any questions. If we did, we can't, we can't see them. So let me pause just to see if anything's popped up before I kind of go to my last question. No, everybody's been really quiet during our session today. <laughs> all right, that's fine. Um, all right, so um, maybe as a, as, a, as a way to kind of just, just you know, kind of wrap up, um, I wonder if, if maybe you can make a comment on the importance, I'm gonna presume you think it's important and, and maybe what we can do about it of intentional course design, because that seems to me the, the factor that was missing in those emergency remote instructed courses that pivoted. Uh, they may have had some intentional design in the classroom, but when they got thrown into Zoom, it was sort of you know, in a life raft and they were just doing the best that they could faculty. And I'm not faulting them at all, I think what they did was fairly remarkable that we kept these universities and colleges running, but that does not mean it was the best that we can do. And if we're going to continue teaching in a synchronous online modality going forward, then we should strive to do the best we can do. And that, that implies intentional design. Um, so kind of without retreading some of the faculty development conversation, but just more on the course design and delivery side, I wonder if you have any thoughts in the, in the last three minutes that we have here. I'm going to just throw in just uh, a couple of things to, I think, um, keep in mind. One is um, many of us were pulled into um, leadership or we were given a platform to talk about the things that we didn't really have before the pandemic, right? And then many of us found ourselves in a situation to be the Cato, the chief academic technology officer on campuses that, that, that doesn't exist. I mean, Shauna, you're not one of those, but it doesn't exist on our campus. So this person that will operate between academics and technology and research and students, I mean, that I think um, is, is an important role that we need to hold on to uh, because that person becomes the advocate for design and design thinking and pedagogy. and keep the conversation away, away from technology a little bit, but know the technology as well. And then um, access, I mean, all of this inequities that the pandemic caused and the access issues. And let's not forget that as we move forward. And, uh, and the Cato position, I think, can also be an advocate for that as well. Yeah, and I, so my position, I, I, maybe I misunderstood, but my position, actually, I am the Chief Academic Technology Officer. I don't know if you were saying that. Sorry, I couldn't yes, hear yes, it yes, cut yes, out a little bit. Oh, I couldn't I agree with you more. These positions are so, so critical. Like, they just are, and they, should, they need to be in an academic unit or on the academic side of the house to really help put up guardrails around that intentional design, right? And really quality use of instructional tools and the research and all those pieces, I just think are critical to keep your campus um, pointed in the right direction. And it would be very easy to lose all of that if you don't have a position like this um, that is in an academic unit. I just, I think it's absolutely critical and, um, you know, I think, you know, when we talk about intentional design, there's some huge strategies we're going to have to be thinking about. And how do we prioritize what courses, what programs do get this type of intentional design? And how is the campus going to invest in, in pri that priority set, right? And that's kind of what our campus is really going through that right now, recognizing that we have to have that intentional design in certain types of courses and we can't do it for all of them. So how do we make that, how do we prioritize? How do we get deans and other leaders on board with the way in which we wanna go about and prioritize? I mean, all of those are things that, that are very complex um, that we really need to be thinking about. And I think having the Cato role is really critical for that. Yeah, thank you both. Um, all right, so shameless plug in my podcast, which is a teaching online podcast, podcast. I did recently interview Shauna 
about this topic, about the topic of the chief academic technology officer. And we, we spent some time really kind of unpeeling that. Um, no, no, you know, I didn't listen to it. <laughs> well, it hasn't aired yet. Um, so yeah, you're good. <laughs> yeah, no yeah, yes. Yeah. <laughs> but it, it'll be released maybe before the end of the year, that's what we're hoping. Um, so yeah, if you're, if you're interested in more in that conversation. So Yakut and Shauna, thank you so much for, um, for taking the time to have this conversation, uh, to discuss the great conflation and how to repair our reputation as online learning professionals post COVID. Um, Mark, any housekeeping that we need to do before, before we wrap up? No, that was a wonderful presentation.